Now let us move on to some other aspects of managing waiting lines. In addition to the waiting line characteristics, it is also very important to consider the behavioral aspects of the waiting system. Often, even more important than the actual time spent waiting, or the number of customers in line, is the customer's perception of the wait. Now there is a story of two office buildings that were serviced by an elevator company. The company received numerous complaints from customers in one of the buildings about how slow the elevators were and that capacity was inadequate. Engineers from the elevator company went to study the problem and decided to compare the two elevator installations. Based on their study, they concluded that the buildings were similar in size, the elevators were similar in size and usage patterns, and the wait times and capacity were also similar. Yet, users in one building generated no end of complaints. The engineers made some changes to the elevators, and soon the complaints stopped. Now guess what the changes were? At the landing on every floor, they installed mirrors. Now here I am, standing, waiting for the elevator, and I don't feel so badly because I'm busy adjusting my tie and straightening my hair. So it's not just the amount of waiting time, but also the customer's perception of the wait. At the same time, it is very important to figure out how much waiting is acceptable to the customer and work backwards from that to adjust our lambda and mu accordingly. When we think about the customer's notion of acceptable waiting time, it is important to note that the customer's irritation does not increase in a linear fashion. Suppose a customer is okay with a three minute wait time. After four minutes, the customer is starting to get upset. By five minutes, the customer is complaining stridently and asking to see the manager. By six minutes, the customer has gone ballistic and you have to scrape him or her off the ceiling. Often the customer's perception of the wait time can be influenced by installing distractions. The mirrors in the elevator example earlier are an illustration. Let me give you another example of an amusement park ride. I looked at the relatively short line outside the building and quickly decided to stand in line. After a short wait, I was inside. Along with about 20 other people, I found myself in a spooky chamber with the lights dimmed and ghoulish sounds filling the air. Now a TV screen on one side showed some spooky images and a voice warned of the dangers ahead. Then the lights brightened. A door opened and we were led through a dimly lit passageway to another chamber. Now once again, the lights dimmed and more spooky stuff happened. And then another hallway and another chamber and so on. Finally, we were at the entrance to an elevator ride with the promise of mysterious consequences. As the elevator rose, spooky voices filled the air. Suddenly, the bottom fell out and we dropped several floors. By the time we recovered from our screaming fits, we were exiting the elevator and the building. Now consider that the actual ride in this instance lasted only about 45 seconds. For that, I had stood in line for about 15 minutes, which I found to be reasonable. In addition to the waiting, I had also spent time inside the building for over 20 minutes, waiting to be ushered to the main ride. Yet, I do not feel that these 20 minutes were part of the waiting. Rather, I was distracted enough to consider it part of the service. Now, of course, if I repeated that ride over and over, I might get wiser. But in my mind, only the 15 minutes outside the building was considered waiting. Another useful tool is to get customers physically out of line. Consider the deli counter at my local grocery store. I am asked to take a number to stand in line. I don't really have to stand in line physically and can even be free to move around the store completing the rest of my shopping. Oftentimes, reminding customers of the waiting time adds to their discomfort. 
In some situations, however, it may be a good idea. Suppose you phone the customer support number of some company. The machine voice announces to you that a customer service representative will be with you shortly. You are now stuck to the phone for an indefinite period of time. If you are like me, you dread such a situation and hang up without even giving them a fair chance. On the other hand, say the machine lets you know that the approximate wait time is 5 minutes and 30 seconds. You now have the luxury of going to the bathroom, then fixing yourself a cup of coffee, and still getting back in time for the call. Another good example is how the rides in many amusement parks display waiting time estimates. Given that each ride is different, an average customer is unable to assess the waiting time by simply looking at the waiting line, indeed the visible portion of the waiting line. Now armed with an inaccurate estimate, the customer is now set up for frustration. A display of the waiting time precludes such frustration. When we think about capacity, we do not always automatically think about demand also, but we really should. Capacity management and demand management are like two sides of the same coin. When I go to the movies in the afternoon, the ticket costs much less than it does in the evening. Now why is that so? Well, that's because the demand is higher in the evening, but the capacity cannot be increased beyond a certain limit. There are only so many seats in the theater. Even when seating is available, filling the theater close to the limit reduces customer satisfaction. Therefore, the theater is offering me an incentive to change my preference from evening to afternoon. Now suppose I go to the local grocery store and complete my purchases and stand in line at the checkout. Let's say there's only one register open and I am number three in a line of five customers. It looks like it will be a few minutes before it's my turn, so I wait patiently, checking out the nearby magazine rack. The guy behind me starts up a light conversation with the old lady behind him. We all seem to be a pretty content and well-mannered bunch. Just then, a couple of store employees walk into the scene. They keep chatting among themselves. They don't attempt to open up one of the nearby registers or even help the employee at our register. After all, they are on break. And that is when my blood pressure begins to rise. The guy behind me loudly expresses his displeasure. And the old lady behind him soon hits the ceiling. The entire situation could have been avoided if the employees did not take their break in our presence. Now, after this incident, I reach the register. The cashier talks cheerily, and by the end of the conversation, my blood pressure is back to normal. The guy and old lady behind me are also smiling at our banter. Now, that is the power of a friendly server. Now, when we're talking about a friendly server, many companies try to coach their employees to be friendly. Let's say instead the cashier had a morose look while scanning my items. Now he or she has worked a long day in a system that was designed for high capacity utilization and you can see that this person is visibly tired. While handing me my bags as instructed in the store training manual, the cashier pulls out a smile and says, Thank you for shopping at XYZ store. Unfortunately for the store, I'm not fooled by the employee's fake friendliness as instructed in the training manual. In such a situation, you can see why it may be important to plan for a lower capacity utilization. A lower capacity utilization not only allows for the 70% rule of thumb that we discussed earlier, but it will also ensure a genuinely friendly server and a genuinely friendly server is the one who has the power to reduce my blood pressure, not a fake friendly server.